Hello, afternoon, everyone. Uh, get some slides up, and we've got a clicker. Don't have to do the next slide thing. Um, so, just to uh, introduce myself, then, I'm Tom Domit. I'm the head of historic environment for the National Trust. Um, we are an organisation working at scale. Uh, so, we are the biggest conservation charity in Europe. We have about 500 pay for entry places uh, across our portfolio, about 20 million visits, and of course, about 2 million scones a year. Um, that's probably the most monitored figure in the trust. Um, but our land is really what's at the heart of what makes the trust special. So we may be known quite often for a country house visit, but actually we own about a quarter of a million uh, hectares of land, 780 miles of coastline. We are the nation's largest farmer. Um, we have places at nine World Heritage sites and lots of other impressive facts and figures and numbers about uh, the, the sorts of assets that we look after. Uh, we have a, a central team around the historic environment of senior archaeologists uh, and then a number of uh, fantastic archaeologists across the regions and countries um, who have an incredible diversity of, of experience and knowledge, um, which is what we used to, uh, uh, to bring to bear to get, to get really good outcomes. Uh, and you've heard from, uh, from Philippa today. Um, and we have a, a vision, a vision that is absolutely about where the historic environment fundamentally underpins, uh, leads for and answers the big issues that matter to people's lives. So it's around climate change, it's around the decline of nature, it's around uh, inclusivity, identity and well-being. And it's really important for us that the historic environment is framed as being not about the past, but about the future. It's a future making activity uh, that we are engaged with. And so I just wanted to touch on our approach to the historic environment in the outdoors, our sort of underpinning philosophy around it, um, and, uh, and really that ambition that we have that is about shifting our philosophy and practice and the narrative um, to recognize that value and potential of the historic environment to actively shape the future of our landscapes, not just to be um, responding to change. And we're really clear about what we need to do and why we need to do it, which is around uh, the restoration and creation of, of habitats, the recovery of nature, uh, addressing uh, the climate crisis. And the really important thing for us is that we make heritage the how of that process. Um, We've got a number of different sort of work streams or work packages that are around this, uh, this aspect of, of, of really valuing and uh, taking a really applied approach to the historic environment. Um, so whether that's through national campaigns like our Blossom Watch campaign, so taking something that is ostensibly around uh, uh, nature uh, and, and the appreciation and connection of people with nature, um, and actually through some of the work that we've done um, with Iris around lost orchards, around uh, lost boundary features, really grounding that ambition around people's connection to nature and nature recovery in the historic environment. Um, you saw from some of the maps that it showed around just how degraded landscapes have become over the last hundred years, how homogenous they've become in many ways. And so actually addressing that kind of shifting baseline syndrome where people's expectations of what a landscape can deliver um, are, are lessened because our memories are so short um, yeah, anything that we can do to encourage people to think differently about the opportunities and the potential of the landscape that we can learn from how it used to be um, is, is really important to us. We're working around uh, culture and heritage capital and those approaches to the valuation so that we can align with things like natural capital uh, and incorporate culture more easily into our decision making process and that's going to be a, a, a long term piece. Um, but also around things like uh, acknowledging the well-being contribution that the historic environment makes in the outdoors. You know, there's a, a, a very prevalent narrative around the outdoors equals nature equals well-being. And there is a good bit of work to do to introduce some nuance to that, to understand the kind of uh, force multiplier factor that the historic environment brings to, uh, to the natural environment. And the fact that of course, I'm speaking to the right room. There are no natural environments. These are all uh, managed cultural spaces. We are working around that opportunity-led piece, and, and you'll hear a lot of the same sorts of messages. You know, it's been great hearing about you know, usable heritage, about 
active living heritage, about moving con from constraint to opportunity, and that's absolutely what we are totally focused on. Um, and using every bit of available data that we can to help our teams inform their decisions through the historic environment. So whether that's the historic landscape characterization work, whether it's around our HER data and what that tells us about formal land use, um, whether it's around uh, place name evidence and more intangible cultural heritage, absolutely everything that we can do um, to push that forward. And, and it's really important as well that this isn't about uh, sort of a turning back the clock um, or, or, or freezing the clock. This is about allowing people to be inspired to use the past to help us think about the future, to challenge preconceptions. Um, uh, and, and, and exactly as Sam said, you know, to be able to then introduce new things which actually make that place even richer um, and more significant uh, rather than being in that, uh, in that more mitigation space. And, and just trying to embed that sense of heritage, how we are um, too often ending up in this space around heritage, uh, where it's considered as part of the implementation, part of the operation of, uh, of a space or a site. Um, and really, you know, the National Trust has worked quite hard to develop a, a foundation piece, a theory of change around our landscape change and our landscape management. Um, that is around uh, landscape and heritage being integral, um, about it delivering uh, a positive land management, um, inspiring people to connect with the heritage, um, which is ultimately what we're after, and how heritage and a historic environment should be built into all of these stages from that very early phase of understanding through to informing the design approach that we take. And often there is a, 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 a desire to talk in terms of natural processes and, uh, and things like that. But actually, these are all design choices. They are all lines being drawn on maps and decisions being taken by people um, about how, how we want the landscape to look and what we want it to do for us. And that is no different from, um, from how it's always been. And right through to thinking about how we, uh, in, and this is maybe a bit of extra trusty jargon, but activating spaces. So how do we actually then bring those spaces to life for people? How do we design them in such a way that we will be able to talk to them about that landscape and connect them with that landscape and that place. Um, and really making sure that, uh, uh, that we are building that sustainability of place by giving it relevance, by layering on as much meaning and significance to as many different people uh, as possible. Um, I thought I'd share just sort of one example that might illustrate what I'm talking about. And, uh, and this is one I really like um, because it's come from uh, a beaver reintroduction site uh, in the southwest. And we have very specifically chosen a historic environment asset um, to be the focus of that reintroduction. So this is actually happening on the site of some uh, 18th, 19th century uh, mill ponds, that incorrectly described on the historic map. Um, that were disused, that were difficult to manage in terms of their condition, perhaps not particularly significant on their own, although as part of the wider landscape, interesting, uh, and then have specifically chosen that site as a place to reintroduce beavers. Uh, those ponds offer the perfect environment for the beavers to establish. We've introduced a whole new level of significance to that site. There are far, far more people aware of and engaged with that heritage now as a result of the beaver reintroduction. Um, and it's now got a real purpose. It is absolutely in that, uh, that usable historic environment space. And that's really what we're trying to, to push towards. For us, failure looks like a fence. Failure is where we are trying to insulate the heritage from change uh, and trying to protect it in that way. And ultimately, I think that's quite self-defeating. What we need to be doing is incorporating it with change. And the same is actually true, not just of the sites, but of our knowledge. You know, there is no way that archaeologists can be the only people who are the advocates for the historic environment. This needs to be a, a real shared aim uh, across all of our teams. Um, so that's really what we are trying to focus on, trying to focus on those opportunities for heritage and nature to work together. <laughs>